Evelyn didn't see. Like she was so focused on what she was handling that she didn't realize her husband was there with her along the way. Like he got her out of like, a lot of trouble throughout the whole film. Hello everyone, my name is Jason Ramirez and welcome to the Hit List Podcast, a podcast where me and a guest cross off films from our watch list and discuss them. This is season 5 episode 11 aka the season 5 finale and to celebrate the finale we're going to be doing this in audio only. <laughs> so <laughs> to celebrate I want to tell you guys about this podcaster and podcaster influencer who's joining me today for this podcast. We met a couple months back uh, at a podcast movement, a convention for podcasters. Her name is Ariel Nissenblatt and I'm really happy she's here. So thank you. Welcome Ariel. Thank you for being on the show. I'm very excited to be here and you pronounce my name so perfectly correctly and I appreciate that very much. It helps that your Twitter handle is Ariel Nissenblatt pronounced like this and that. So Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so before we get started, I have two questions for you. What are your viewing habits when you sit down to watch a movie? Do you stick to your favorites to watch something new? And this is specifically for movies, not podcasts, because I know you listen to a lot of podcasts. Yeah, I almost never watch movies. So <laughs> it was fun to be asked to be on the show because I actively chose a movie that I wanted to see because and I had been on, you know, not necessarily my list because I don't have a list of movies <laughs> that I want to see. I probably should. Whenever I do watch a movie, I'm like, wow, that was awesome. I should do this more often. And then I don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I would say every once in a while, I will see a movie in theaters. I don't think I've seen a movie in theaters. Let's say before the pandemic, I don't think I've seen a movie in theaters, but before the pandemic, I think I would see a movie twice a year in theaters. And then maybe six times throughout the year it would be an occasion with friends to be like, you know what, let's stay in and watch a movie on my own since the pandemic has been a thing. And like, since the pandemic, I... Don't I honestly can probably count on one hand the movies that I've seen. I think I opt for shorter TV shows if I'm going to watch something at all. But as you said, I do listen to a lot. That's how I consume a lot of my entertainment and even educational content. I like that you're uh, not the typical guest on my show because right. everyone else either watches a lot of movies or they don't. Or they do something else. You're the only one that's like actively wa listens to podcasts instead of watching movies. So or or like not playing video games too. So thank like, no, you. Yeah. No, I never I never play video games. My excuse is that I didn't grow up with brothers. But then I say that, and everyone's like, "That's sexist. You can play video games as a girl." And I'm like, "I, I know, but like I don't know." <laughs> yeah, I my parents made the active decision to not give me any video games because they thought it would be distraction to me, which. Props to them, because even without video games, I sucked at school. <laughs> <laughs> so my second question for you is, what's something about you that people would be surprised to know? Something about me that people would be surprised to know is that I can speak almost fluent Hebrew. Oh. Maybe maybe you would know that if you know Jewish last names and can... <laughs> And you know that Nissenblatt is a Jewish last name. You're like, oh, okay, she's Jewish. Maybe she speaks Hebrew. But like, I'm pretty good at it. <laughs> and I, I've um, seen your Hanukkah posts. Yeah, hell yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, what else? I yeah, I'm like pretty good at Hebrew. I can fully hold a conversation. Um, and I don't know. That's a lot of fun. And I think because of that, I, I have a strong desire to learn more languages. So that's not quite a fact. It's just more of like a, a desire for, um, I guess, 2023. We're, we're recording this in late 2022. And I hope to, in 2023, start taking Spanish classes and really learn some more languages. Yeah, I think the benefit of learning another language is that you can have more guests on your show who mm -hmm. speak another language. I made that joke with uh, Ryan from a previous episode from the season where we talk, I said, I really want Ana de Armas to be on the show. Ooh. And I mean, he said, Ana, venite aquí, podemos hablar en español. <laughs> and he's like, there we go. You know, I could interview Spanish guests. And I was like, huh, I really could. Could It I? opens up a ton of possibilities. Yeah, it definitely does. Mm -hmm. So let's can get to the movie today. And before we recorded, Ariel, you did say this is quite the movie to end the season with. I think so. Today, we're going to be discussing Everything Everywhere All at Once. Everything Everywhere All at Once is a 2022 American absurdist comedy drama film written and directed by Daniel Kwan and Daniel Scheiner, collectively known as Daniels, who produced it with Anthony and Joe Russo. The plot centers on a Chinese-American immigrant who, while being audited by the IRS, discovers that she must connect with a parallel universe versions of herself to prevent a powerful being from destroying the universe. 
Stephanie Shu, Michelle Yeo, Kihi Kwan, Jenny Slate, Harry Shum Jr., James Honk, and Jamie Lee Curtis appear in this film. So this movie was on Ariel's watch list. Ariel, why was this movie on your list? I listen to a lot of podcasts, as you know, and I listen to a lot of podcasts about pop culture. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the shows that I listened to back in March, when did this movie come out? Earlier in 2022, right? April. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So around that time, March, April, May, people were talking about the ramp up to the movie Mm -hmm. and then the movie itself and then the discussion around the movie, the discourse that it produced. And so many of those shows, I'm thinking in particular Pop Culture Happy Hour or It's Been a Minute with Sam Sanders or shows like that. I was like, you know, high praise from them about this about this movie and some people had some controversial not controversial some people had some ideas about the movie that you know they were like i don't think that most people are going to agree with me about this but i either liked it or i didn't like it or i was confused or i wasn't confused and i was like i've got to know what they're talking about you know so (laughs) so back then i was like i first of all i want to see see this in theaters but i never got around to it i think i was out of the country at the time and then when i got back i was like yeah i still want to see this but i don't know how to see it um and then i just like you know, forgot about it until you asked me to be on the show. And you basically gave me the opportunity to watch any movie that I wanted to watch. (laughs) And I was like, this one, this is the one that I want to watch. Yeah. And I had pretty much the same react. This, the reason why it was on your radar is the same reason it's on mine. I just kept seeing a lot of tweets about it. There are some people, uh, you know, filmmakers, any filmmakers who I, who I admire, who praised the movie because they got early access to it and they were praising on Twitter. And, I'm the type of guy like I don't like to watch movies that are too hyped up because it sets me up for disappointment, if that makes sense. But I was like, I, I do trust their opinions on it. And I even said on, on my earlier from like the last season with my episode of Little Baddie, now known as Bats, she basically shared the same opinion. She hasn't seen it. She's not sure if she wants to see it. And I said, yeah, me too. And then a week later, I saw it. I'm like, damn, I'm really glad I watched this in theaters because this, <laughs> really, <laughs> this is pretty awesome. So my next question for you is, what did you think? I, so I watched it last night. So my feelings are still pretty fresh, raw. (laughs) My initial thought was, um, it was long. It was really long. It is. And so just to set the scene, my sister is visiting. She lives in LA and she's been staying with me for the past few nights. And I had a soccer game last night. And when we got back, I was like, all right, let's make a delicious pasta and then sit down to watch this movie. She had already seen the movie, but she was like, it's worth it. I'm going to watch it again. So we made a pasta that I've never made before. We made like a lemon sauce pasta. It was great. I'm usually not very experimental when it comes to the sauces that I make. Usually I just pour in a penne or a vodka sauce or a marinara sauce and I'm just leave it at that. This time I was like, let's try something new. You know, let's put a garnish. Let's put some parsley on there. So we did. We sat down to watch the movie and then I saw that it was, I think, 140 minutes. And I was like, (laughs) I was like, holy snot, Uh, you know, but I was ready because I was like, this is this is going to be good. People talk about how great this movie is. And I was just very ready for the movie to be long and entertaining the whole time. And I think I was definitely entertained the whole time, but I was also confused. And I have (laughs) been confused before watching movies. I think I tried to watch, do you remember the movie Memento? Yes. I think I tried to watch that and I just could not, could not watch it. So movies that, that deal with time warps and different universes and things like that. I am just not used to them. I'm not literate in multiverse. So I think it, I needed some more education and I definitely, I didn't read anything about the plot beforehand. Yes, mm-hmm. I listened to podcasts about it, but I don't, I don't, I think they did a pretty good job not giving away any spoilers, really just talking about how it was confusing, but also very entertaining. And so that's all that I went in knowing. And so my initial reaction was, wow, it was long. I was entertained the whole time, but I'm not in love with it. Mm. Okay. Okay. So what did you, th- I said, what did you think? How, what did you feel? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I I was really vibing with the characters and the plot and the the problem that was being presented until there's the moment in the elevator when they're riding up to the uh, Jamie Lee Curtis's desk, right? Yeah. In the IRS office, and that's when we get the, the first apple. inkling that this is not actually 
uh, like a regular movie, right? That, 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 <laughs> that there are going to be multiverses, that there's going to be multiple um, characters playing multiple, there's going to be characters playing multiple characters, right? Like mm. pe- actors playing multiple characters. And that's when I was like, okay, let me strap in because I'm going to have to, you know, use my thinking cap. This is not a passive movie, right? I, I'm right. going to have to pay attention the whole time because the subtitles will switch between English and Chinese. And so I need to really make sure that I'm I'm on it, right? I can't just like look down at my phone for a second or I can't like go and get oh, yeah. food and keep the TV on. This is a an all in movie. So how did I feel? I felt kind of on edge. How did you feel? <laughs> so I, I, for the first 20 minutes, I thought it was going to be like that, that type of film too, right? So I was very similar um, to what you're feeling. I knew that there was going to be some fight scenes in there. I didn't know the context under which it was happening, but I was excited nonetheless. And I will say that when I was watching throughout the movie, I cried so much that I got wow. dehydrated. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> because I could, I could relate to it like so much, you know? Yeah. Um, and the Daniels, they made a, another movie that I reviewed in the first season of this podcast, which was the Swiss Army Man with Daniel Radcliffe. And I think it was Paul Dano. I think that was him. And I hated that movie because it was oh. just too weird for me. Although there was like some emotional aspect to it, like they have with this movie with everything everywhere. I just didn't like it. So I, I came into this movie like not really expecting much because I hated Swiss Army Man. But I, I really like what they did with this one. They're able to do it better in, in a sense, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I just remember thinking, it's so hard for me as a viewer to keep all of these these things straight, right? Like, <laughs> which universes, which characters belong to which universes, and why, what do they call it when you have to, like, chew gum from under the table in order to cause yourself to be able to jump into the next universe launching pads or something like that yeah yeah remember Mm -hmm. um and i was like how do they come up with these things i was almost and i think the when you read the description just a few minutes ago and you said it's an absurdist movie i was like okay yes that makes sense like grabbing Mm -hmm. gum from under a table and chewing it or like eating chapstick in order to (laughs) cause yourself to jump into another universe or giving yourself paper cuts (laughs) yes ow i was like that is absurd that is like it doesn't have to make sense you know what i mean it Mm -hmm. it doesn't have to make sense in order for the point to to be made which is that you know this is a a time travel slash universe travel slash you know break your brain type movie yeah and you're not the only one that was confused by like which universe they're when the costume designers also had trouble figuring out which costume was for like which universe like wait which Mm. universe is this one oh is this like the original timeline or which one is it are we at this certain point so you're not the only one that was confused with the universe that had to be on purpose right like you want to believe that that was on purpose that somebody had a grand plan like overwhelming the the audience yeah yeah that was definitely on purpose they i watched a commentary with both daniels they said that the idea was to overwhelm the audience but not too soon you know, so like mm. for the first 20 minutes, it's like a regular family drama with some bits of like comedy shown in. Like you see with the cameras, like the security cameras, you see Kihi Kwan's character just like flipping around doing yes, stunts. Yes, I did see that. So I don't think yeah. I realized why, but yeah, he was so, yeah. Like jumping even at that time, right? Yeah. So that was just like a hint of what was going to come because that was the whole idea. It was to overwhelm you like eventually, but not too soon. Right. So that was definitely on purpose. Yeah. You're left being like, you know why do they need to go into this next universe or or why did this not happen until this point why did the irs the inquiry from the irs trigger this this moment for the main character right right why the elevator there (laughs) why why the divorce papers why is that the the impetus for all of this happening and why are why is it only happening to this family was a question that i had because it did seem like it was only happening to this family until gong gong was in alpha gong gong like sitting in his um like control the, center and then mm-hmm. he said something like you know round up all of the the the, the agents and then everybody else was in on it but why mm-hmm. so i was like okay plot holes but probably not like i i, I it's not plot holes it's more just like absurd i think <laughs> yeah yeah you're right it's not really plot hole. i think it's just like the way it happens it's like with like star wars like why is only the skywalker family the only ones fucking up the whole universe you know right um so i think with this in this sense because they said like evelyn is her potential is so great that in one of the universes she was able to create that you uni- that universe hopping machine 
and that's what fucked up. And in each universe, she her potential is realized everywhere except for the one that that we have in this movie. We're like supposedly that's her failed life, you know. So I yeah. think that's that's that might be a part of it. But honestly, I I don't care. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I it, it, it's like one of those things like, yeah, it's a good question, but do we really need to know? You know. But yeah, that's 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 my answer. <laughs> what was your favorite life of hers? My favorite life of hers. Um. There was a lot that happened. And we only got glimpses into yeah. some of them, whereas others had more drawn out pl- plot lines, right? Like her movie star life, her. Um, then we got a little bit more of an insight into what another love story could have been mm-hmm. with her and her husband. Uh, but then Hot Dog Fingers, we got a little bit more. In Hot Dog Fingers, were her and Jamie Lee Curtis lovers? I couldn't figure they that were. out. Yeah. That's fascinating. I love that. <laughs> Yeah, and I would have to say the Rekakuni Evelyn. Oh my god, I forgot about that one. <laughs> because like she said it early in the movie, like Rekakuni, are you talking about Ratatouille? But no, yes. she actually meant Rekakuni, <laughs> and how she like she was able to be controlled with her hair as well. I thought that was hilarious, and she thought that was really funny too. Michelle Yeoh. Oh yeah. Like there's like this scene where like the the dude is crying. He's like Rekakuni, he taught me so much, and. There was one take where, like, I think it's the only time she actually laughed while they're doing it because he said, I'm not even Japanese. And she just lost it. <laughs> <laughs> and Michelle Yo, she also thought that, like, the hot dog fingers wasn't going to be, like, left in. Bill's left oh, in. Um, because the thing is, it, the movie is about, like, empathy, right? Like, just getting empathy for, like, other yeah. people. And the biggest obstacle for Evelyn is getting empathy for Jamie Lee Curtis's character because she seems like a hard ass, you know? Like she, and for her daughter. A, yeah, and for her daughter as well. Um, like her daughter is like easier because you know it's yeah. her daughter. She has that connection. But with Jamie Lee Curtis, she's just like a stranger to her. Like she's antagonizing them the whole time. Like for all she knows, she's doing this to them. She's uttering them like on purpose. That's all she knows. And it's hard to like her, you know. But after going for like the hot dog fingers universe, she was able to help her like realize that she's not unlovable. She's a she is capable of being loved, and you know that's what like. That was her overcoming like the obstacle of getting through empathy. So that's what I liked about that aspect of it. So even though Hot Dog Fingers was weird, it no, was it still, was perfect, right? It was still it was still touching, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, and I don't know, just it wasn't clear at first that their hot dog fingers were unusable until towards the end when somebody said something like, We get really good at using our toes, right? And then you see them <laughs> playing the piano with their toes and then she has a brace she has a carpal tunnel brace on her toes i was like right? that is, on her feet that is such a good such a good point that they made right. <laughs> what i liked about that is like it's actual human hands inside the feet that they made it oh, and it was yeah. an actual piano player playing the actual keys because usually whenever someone plays an instrument on movies the keys don't match with the music but this one actually did hmm. they made the effort to make it look good real point. So, yeah, it's a, it's a lot that they went into this movie that I really like. So, who was a character or like what moment or character resonated with you the most? I mean, I thought what was interesting was Jenny Slate's character actually because I was talking about it with my sister. We were trying to figure out if Jenny Slate's character was coded as Jewish or coded as Italian, right? Mm. Or coded as something that uh, she's white for sure, but is she She's clearly meant to be like just a, somebody who patronizes the store, right? right? But they call her Big Nose, which is usually <laughs> something that is like a Jewish stereotype. So my mm-hmm. sis and she is Jewish in real life. So my sister and I were Jewish and we were watching it and we were like, is that like what do we think about that, right? So that was interesting to me. I wouldn't say I necessarily like felt myself in her shoes because she was we were talking about this offline but like you know just not a great um patron you know just somebody who like felt a little Mm. bit entitled when it came to this store that she was in um and the the people that are doing work for her so i don't really identify with that i try to be nicer to service workers but thank you (laughs) but (laughs) i um i did find that I guess as a white character within I'm, I'm white. And I guess as a white character within this universe of people who are mostly people of color, I was like, okay, yeah, that that's sort of an interesting position to be in. Yeah. And that's something I didn't really know. I didn't, I just didn't know like big nose is just like a term that's coded meant. as Jews. Yeah. yeah. And so. I didn't pick up on it at first either because later in the show, uh, in movie movie later in the movie is what prompted me to ask my sister, do you think she's Italian coded? 
And my sister was like, no, she's Jewish coded because they referred to her nose. And I was like, oh, Mm. and she's Jewish in real life. Interesting. Right. And Mm. I thought, first of all, I thought it was interesting that Jenny Slate's character came back for the party because when (laughs) Evelyn in the beginning was inviting her to the party, it was clear that that Jenny Slate's character was shrugging her off, right? She was saying like, oh, thank you so much. I'm just going to take my dry cleaning and go. And then she came back to the party, which mm. was a fascinating show of community, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I, now, I, I, I was confused by that as well, because usually yeah. when I shrug off people, I mean it. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like, why would she come back? Yeah. I'd hmm. be curious to hear from somebody who wrote that. I, I, why I, it's necessary, first of all, for the plot to come, for her to come back. Was yeah. it, do you think? Like, what did she really do in the end? Was, was she... Was she integral in any of the final scenes or any of the the jokes or bits towards the end? No. I know she was an agent and there's a deleted scene with her on that staircase that Oh. I think I, I think the they dele- they deleted it because it it was just for time, you know? Mm. Like they didn't want to spend they had they cut like three or four people from that staircase scene. So oh, she wow. was she was involved in that staircase. As far as that, I just didn't really consider that part. I guess like I saw it, but like I was too focused on the story to remember that she was there. I don't know. That's something we can ask the Daniels. So Daniel Kwan and Dan Scheinart, uh, if you if you're listening, we want to hear about this. Or Jenny Slate, yeah. if you know more, have more insight about your character, I would love to hear more about this. Why why she was there at the party? Um, did she have a change of heart about her community? We yeah, I think it's fascinating that she came back. Right? I think maybe it speaks more to. I think it definitely speaks more to the. The family at the center, the family in question, which is that like, yes, this is Evelyn's um, su- supposedly failed life, right? But mm-hmm. really, it's a communal institution, and I- I'm pretty sure this takes place in LA. Did- I don't think they made that explicit, did they? It probably does. I just based on the buses that I saw, and also okay. the weather and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what made me think it was based in LA, and the driving culture, as opposed to taking the subway, things like that. Definitely not New York, but yeah. Anyway, I think it, it, it's fascinating that this, I think that was supposed to be more about the family than it was supposed to be about Jenny Slate, right? That they would come back to celebrate the Chinese New Year. Yeah. That she would come back. And that, and that, and also the, um, this person was left in the staircase scene with the perfume, right? The guy who was like, oh, my late wife's perfume, you smell just like it. Mm-hmm. And he came back also because he clearly had a, had a nice um, <laughs> relationship with the family. Yeah, because he he was joking around with um what's his name, Waymond. Waymond. Yeah, <laughs> which is a great name. <laughs> yeah, I love it. And for me, the character I resonate with the most is Waymond. Hmm. You know, I like how they made him as like a quote unquote beta male on purpose, because we we have a lot of these movies where they refer to them as like alphas, whatever, which. I just want to put this out here. I hate that, like how people, how men refer to themselves like as an alpha Ugh. male and yeah. other men as beta males because even the person who came up with the term for like alpha wolves, he later realized he was wrong about that. You know, it's but like not scientifically accurate. It, exactly. <laughs> so, but they still keep saying that because like they may want, they, they want to make themselves sound cool. But anyway, it, it's kind of like perpetuated in our culture as well, in our film culture where like all these leads, male leads are, you know, people who are considered quote unquote alpha you know we got like Arnold Schwarzenegger with his action films and most recently Keanu Reeves with his John Wick series we don't really see someone like Waymond unless they're in a supporting role and this one he's a lead role and he doesn't want people to fight like he he's scared and he's confused but he doesn't want he doesn't want people to fight he even says that like just be kind to each other like just sit down and talk about it we don't need to do all this crazy things we just we could just figure it out together and I like that because you don't see that in like a lot of movies that we see, unless they're like indie films, which this is kind of considered indie. And yeah, I really like this character and his speech made me cry the most. Which one? The one where Evelyn's kind of going off the deep end and he kind of saves her from being arrested by the police and across like the universes, like the one in the one car white inspired universe. He's saying like, even though you've broken my heart uh, again, in another life, I would like, I would love to just do laundry and taxes with you. Yes, that killed me. Yeah. That was very painful. <laughs> and you see how, like, she didn't, Evelyn didn't see, like, she was so focused on what she was handling that she didn't realize her husband was there with her along the way. Like, he got her out of like, a lot of trouble throughout the whole film, you know? 
Um, he was being diplomatic along the way. And yeah, I just really liked his character. Yeah, he was purposely made to be absolutely adorable, which is, <laughs> I guess, a nicer way of saying a beta male. Right. Um, yeah, he was purposely created to make you cry. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it like contrasts because like Evelyn is infatuated with the alpha Waymond, you know? Right. He he knows Kung Fu. He's fighting with the Fanny Pack. You know, he's able to, like, draw off the, the security guards or whatever. And when Alpha Wayman dies, she's, like, disheartened. But then she realizes, like, the husband that she has in her universe, he's a great guy, you know? I wouldn't say that I, again, I wouldn't say I identify with, um, with the main character. What was her? Uh, Joy. But I do completely understand the the position of having parents who just don't get it right. And who don't necessarily accept you for who you are and what you do and sort of want to, even if they try, they can't get it to the Mm -hmm. extent that, and you can't understand them, right? You can't understand your parents. They can't understand you. Different generations experience things differently. And I think that, yeah, that, that was um, another painful a uh, piece of the story, I think, too, was the mother-daughter relationship because, of course, I'm always thinking of my relationship with my mother and how how much we understand each other, how little we understand each other, what we'll never understand about each other, what we are able to actually work on. And to watch as uh, Michelle Yeoh's character did understand more and more about her daughter or at least what she didn't understand and how she could apologize or at least own up to that, that was really beautiful to watch. Yeah, definitely. And it's exactly what made me cry because it's like so relatable. Like I have that not just generational gap, but like the very cultural gap. My parents are immigrants from another country. So they have their own way of viewing things in the world. And having grown up in this country, in the United States, I have my own different way of seeing the world. Um, So I definitely saw the rift because I identify with that rift between the the parents and and their children so now we're going to talk about the production of how this movie was made so a little bit how it was concept dan kwan watched a double feature of fight club and the matrix and pitched dan scheinert the whole multiverse concept and later a family drama exploding across the multiverse and the daniels thought it'd be better to have someone like their parents placed in the movie so they have like really weird movies they thought it'd be funny or interesting to be to drop them in one of their weird movies and watch them struggle to make their way out of it. So that's something that I thought that was like pretty fun. Like, oh, that's kind of pretty much what's happening. Like, it's one of our parents like getting into the movie and not understanding what's happening. <laughs> and at first for the casting, during pre-production, Jackie Chan was considered for the lead role. And the script was originally written for him before Quan and Shiner changed their minds and reconceived the role for a woman feeling that it would make the husband-wife dynamic in the story more relatable. And when Michelle Yeoh received the script, she was really excited because she believed that doing the film would take all the experiences she's had as a filmmaker and actor and fight, fight, you know, fight person, you know? She, she does her own fights. She's oh. been doing it. She's done it with Jackie Chan before. So she That's knows. That's so exa- cool. She, she, she has an extensive history. She's really cool. And it was announced in August 2018 that Yo and Aquafina were cast as star in this. I mean, unfortunately, Aquafina had to exit the project in January 2020 due to mm-hmm. scheduling conflicts. And that's when Stephanie Shu stepped in. Also, Kihi Kwan was cast in this movie. And this marked Kwan's return to film acting when from which he had retired in 2001 due to lack of casting opportunities. Wow. And I, w- I want to talk about him real quick because... You can't talk about this movie without talking about Kihi Kwan's return. Yeah. Here's what happened. So Kihi Kwan, he when he was like 13, 14, around that age, he starred in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. He was shortstop. I think that's that was his character's name. And he appeared in The Goonies. And so as he got older, he saw there was a lack of lead roles for Asian men, for Asian actors, like late teens and early 20s. So he found himself just waiting for a call for an audition, not a job, but just the opportunity to audition. And a call would come in like once a year or once every six months. And all this while his peers were getting auditions two or three times a week and doing movie after movie. 
And so he decided to step away from acting and went to film school and was content working behind the camera. And so this happened. He retired from acting in 2001. And it wasn't until 2018 when Crazy Rich Asians was released that he decided to return. He watched it like three times in theaters and every time he cried because it was like an all Asian cast. And he felt he had like serious FOMO. Like he missed, he felt like he really missed out. So after he watched it, he called a friend. He asked if he could be his representative. And his friend said, yeah. And this is like decades after not having a representative. And then two weeks later, he got a call for, for this movie, for Everything Everywhere All at Once. Jamie Lee Curtis says that on day one of shooting, when they did their scene, which is at the IRS office, after doing it, Key leaned in. He's like, was that, was that okay? And she's like, dude, you did great. What are you talking about? I mean, he told her, like, this is him coming back after 20 years of not doing this. And she was shocked because it was his gift to, like, act. And he hasn't been able to do it for decades. And the fact that he's able to come back from that and do this movie, like, she was just amazed at that, you know. Wow. And he reflected that on that day, on that same day, the first day, he had a panic attack. Because he was working across from Jamie Lee Curtis and he was sitting next to Michelle Yeoh and James Hong, like, legendary actors, according to him. And in that same round table, um, Jamie Lee Curtis, she said, well, guess what? You are too. That's adorable and affirming and makes me cry. <laughs> <laughs> right? And it just makes me feel like so mad. Like we were robbed of him for 20 yeah, years. I know. That's so. Like, that's a long time. R- like literally, like we, we've gone through some shit. <laughs> like we only saw him when he was like very young and now he's a middle-aged man. We never got yeah, to see him in between. It's so crazy. So anyway, filming began in January 2020. It was shot in Simi Valley, California. And there were multiple kung fu fight scenes. And normally one scene would take two to three weeks. Wow. um, Particularly like the fanny pack fight scene. I know this from personal experience because for a time I did do fight choreography for like film specifically. Like just like 10 seconds on screen takes like a lot and practice and a lot more to film so like it looks like 10 seconds to us but a lot went into that (laughs) that's fascinating and do you know how how long it takes to film a fight scene on audio or to record a fight scene on audio um i'm not sure i do know they did a lot of adr for this one though yeah i mean truly you could you can you can depict a fight scene without fully sound designing it right like you can tell me anything with audio and as long as you are convincing about it we could be in space you know we could be recording this in space right now as long as we sound design that or even if we were just like we're recording this in space and then all of a sudden it's in space it's just a lot cheaper (laughs) (laughs) definitely definitely yeah and for the fanny pack fight scene they're able to do that in a day and a half which is really impressive yeah and the entirety of filming took up to 38 days and a rat early in March wow. of 2020. Lucky. Uh, because of uh, something called a COVID-19. I'm not sure if you've heard of that. Wait, what's that? Uh, I don't know. I think it's like, it, com- it comes up to like COVID-1 for 18 uh, or whatever. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what I found really impressive about the movie. Because there's a lot of visual effects happening. Over 500 visual effects was done by a team of five people during the pandemic. And usually whenever you see a movie with like tons of visual effects, you see like hundreds of people listed in the credits. This is only five people. Wow. And they had to share files and then just email each other and do stuff for Zoom, working together separately to get this movie done. But they all had experience working on music videos that had like quick turnarounds. So they had experience like doing this, but it's still like a large toll because it's not just the visual effects. It's also editing it all together to make it look seamless and make it make sense. And they also shot with practical effects and puppets. So... The raccoon is oh, obviously yeah, of course, the a puppet. And you know, the hot dog fingers were molded to the actor's actual hands. So they didn't just like give make hot dog fingers for them. They molded it to their hands. Wow. And <laughs> they the pinky And there were finger- a lot of actors involved in hot dog fingers. It wasn't just Jamie Lee Curtis and Michelle Yeoh. Yeah, there was like the the, the, the TV. dancers. Yeah. yeah. And the pinky finger muscle, if you remember, like the oh yeah, that was an actual puppet. It wasn't CG. It was an actual puppet. I was wondering. <laughs> and for practical effects, you know that scene when she's like on that chair in the in the IRS office and she like goes back into the closet. Yeah. So the way that happened, they actually physically rolled her 
but they did it in like they made her act in slow motion while they were doing it so that in the edit booth they can like make it look they can fast forward it wow. and make it look like it was all really fast when really she was safe the whole time tricked ya <laughs> For the scene where Evelyn piggyback rides on that guy, like Rakakuni. Oh yeah. They used wires and rigs for wires and rigs for that because, you know, that's a very dangerous thing to do. But it's just really funny, like cause they didn't want to do it at first, like the people who were like the safety people. But they're they they were able to find a way to do it. And I'm glad they put that in because that's one of the funniest scenes in the movie. Just the way how And then she went, picked him up and they went really fast. And I was yeah. like, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if and when she stops and like he flies over to Rakakuni. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just love saying that, Rakakuni. <laughs> and the location they shot in. So the building they use is an old mortgage lending fir- firm that was that closed down in the previous recession. So that was in 2008. And a lot of people have shot there for music videos and movies because of the atrium. It looks really retro looking. At first, they thought the building was too big and too intimidating to shoot in. But when they looked at other buildings, they thought this is probably the only place we could shoot it in. So they turned it into their own little mini studio. So in that building, you had the IRS office, you had the executive offices, you had the cafeteria, and you had the Wong family apartment. So they shot all that in that same building. And when, if they needed to make the day, they could just send a B crew running across the set to get the shots they needed. So stuff like Evelyn putting his shoes on the wrong feet and other pickup shots like that. Oh, yeah, and as far as, like, genre genre mixing, they went into this movie knowing that most of the audience is already well aver- well versed in what genres are going to be in this movie because whether they know it or not, they can tell, like, oh, this is going to be, like, an old kung fu movie or, oh, this is going to be, like, a drama. So they just played with it using, like, the different aspect ratios. So for, like, the old, like, flashback scenes, the aspect ratios are, like, more like a square. And for, like, the fight scenes, they just made it look wider, like, for Uh some of the scenes. Wow. And that's something that you don't necessarily know to look for if you're a viewer. If you're not a... If you're me and you don't watch that many movies. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But it still affects you without realizing. Yeah. Or if you're like me, I like, I know this stuff, but, like, I try to ignore my knowledge. Like, I try to, Uh like, forget about it so I can just enjoy the movie. So even though some of them were obvious, some of them weren't so obvious. Like, oh... But rewatching, I'm like, oh, okay. Aspect ratio went from square to rectangle. I see what you did there. <laughs> like, what are you trying to convey? <laughs> and the fight scenes um, were done by, it was choreographed by a group called the Marshall Club. I know about them. I know a guy who's worked with them. They also worked on that movie, Shang-Chi. One of the actors who was in this movie, he was playing, he played as the deaf dealer in that movie. He had like the mask, whatever. And do you, do you think I've seen it? I have not seen it. I have not seen any movies. <laughs> it's an okay movie. I don't think you're missing much. <laughs> I, it got a lot of it got a lot of press. I will say that I I went to a really interesting concert that was musical scores. It mm-hmm. was just musical scores in concert in Spain, and Shang Chi was um, was being depicted there, and it was really beautiful. Oh. It, was, it was awesome, and I was like, okay, yeah. I could listen to this movie's music all day long. <laughs> it's pretty good. I, but like I haven't it. seen the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's okay. It's okay. I like the fight scenes. Mm. But someone else said it. Watching the fight scenes just reminded them how they could have gone further with it mm. and just made them miss the old Hong Kong movies that they were taking inspiration from. So they went home and watched the old Hong Kong movies. They're like, oh, okay. So this is, this is still better. <laughs> that but was for Shang-Chi or for this? For one? Shang-Chi. For Shang-Chi. I, th- I thought the fight scenes here were great. What did you I think? thought that too. Like it's more like a dance, you know. And Michelle yeah. Yeoh, um, you know, she has a dance background. She also has a fight choreography background. So she's able so to cool. work with it very well. My favorite, I think, thing that happened in the fight scenes was somebody threw like a metal pipe through a keyboard, right? And, like <laughs> stabbed it through the keyboard, and I was like, the my only thought was like, could that happen? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Probably. Mm-hmm. The funniest scene that I saw was like the butt plug one. Like oh my god yes trophy. that was hilarious again <laughs> using the word absurdist i'm like yes okay it was an absurdist movie absurdist comedy to a certain mm-hmm. extent yeah definitely and even though there's all this stuff happening um when they were filming it daniels kept reminding them that above all this chaos they're shooting a family drama so it kept them grounded into like what the movie is really about all right so i'm about to end it real quick uh anything else you want to comment on before i end it 
Um, I, can I can I just say uh, it was fun to be able to watch a movie as an assignment. I liked that. I like, uh, you know, watching movies for fun is one thing, but watching movies because you know you're going to have to talk about it is it's fun. It gives you a sense of purpose when you're watching. What am I looking out for? So I appreciate the challenge and thank you for inviting me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That concludes our conversations today. Uh, thank you so much, Ariel, for being here. Ariel for being here. Is it Ariel? You got awesome. it. Yeah. Okay. Hell yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for being here. <laughs> so was everything everywhere all at once a hit or a miss with you? I think overall, I'm glad I watched. Yeah. Can I so, leave it at that? Can I leave it at like a thumb three quarters up? So like like that? Yeah, like a how, pinky how, how, muscle. Except yeah, pinky thumb. muscle. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty strong pinky muscle for me. Gotcha. All right. So is there anything you'd like to promote real quick? If you are looking for podcast recommendations, I have a podcast newsletter for you. If you go to earbuds.audio, you can subscribe and you'll get five podcast episodes on a theme each week curated by a different person. Gotcha. And where can we find you on social media? Just search for Ari This and That on Twitter. That's it for today, folks. You've been listening to the Hit List Podcast. This was the season five finale. My name is Jason. And until next time, cross off a new film from your list. Thank you for listening to the Hit List Podcast. If you like this episode, please consider giving us five stars and leave me a review. You can also follow us on Instagram at the underscore hitlist underscore podcast and TikTok at the hitlist podcast.